It's 26th of December 2011 and this is a walk around my front garden. This first plant you're seeing to the left there is the globe artichoke of course. Distant relative of sunflowers. And there's some scarlet runner beans which are known in New Zealand as seven year beans. As you see those ones are quite vigorous because they've already existed a couple of years and I train them up and have them shade the bedroom window there during the hot part of the year. Looking around there, there's the um, Canary Island date palm in a large pot at the corner there. And behind that is several Fijoa plants. These are all in either plastic buckets or plastic tubs. The Fijoa is known for being a bit temperamental, being not very self-fertile. But this, uh, the biggest one there is actually the Unique, which is a named variety, and it is the only truly self-fertile Fijoa. And as you can see, it's absolutely laden with flowers. Also, a little mandarin there, and a grapefruit is hiding in amongst there. Both in large plastic bucket pots. Buckets with holes in being costing you about a dollar, whereas if you go to Bunnings and buy a plant pot, it's nearly ten dollars. And there's some palms hiding in there. There's a couple of bootiers and some cocos palms. Cyagris or Aracastrum. There's also a couple of Liverstoner Australis or Chinesis, I can't remember, they are Australis. Again, a frost tolerant one hiding amongst them. Bit of a close up there on the Scarlet Runner beans. Oh, there was a bumblebee. Lots of bumblebees. They very, uh, they favour very, very much the uh, Scarlet Runner beans. And you see the roof overhang there, that's known as eaves. That's what stops rain getting in doors and windows and causing houses that are less than 10 years old to require demolition. It's a shame that New Zealand architects aren't aware of that. $20 billion worth of leaky buildings require demolition. So much for that. As we move around a little bit more, try to get a little bit more of a close-up on those Fijoa flowers. As you can see, it's absolutely covered with them at this stage. The fruit being ready to eat somewhere around about April, May. Okay, that in the ground there is a, a Chinese windmill palm, Trachycarpus fortuni, and that what you can see is a couple of uh, Mexican-American cotton palms. They were all smashed down in the earthquake and they're just starting to recover now. And some cactus, various cacti there, prickly pear cacti. A little lemon tree in a bucket pot there. Yeah, fortunately I had some cacti on the roof, because I'd run out of space to put them elsewhere, and some out the front, because most of the ones I had out the back, once a two-story house fell on them, I couldn't even salvage them, they were ruined. There's one of the two, here in New Zealand, called Tamarillo, but they're tree tomatoes. A perennial, live about seven years, grown a lot in the North Island, but they just really can't take the cold here in the South Island. That one was in a bucket, so I was able to carry it in, Every, every cold winter night. Uh, the other couple in large plastic tubs, one died and one's come back again. There's the um, earthquake uh, placards. Obviously red was when I was kicked out for 11 weeks and then when it was reassessed after the neighbouring house was demolished, it was green and I moved back in. See the geranium or pelagonium. If they're protected by that uh, brick wall there, they can get through the winter and up to seven or eight feet high. And it, it's only not high because I keep pruning it. Here's the scarlet runner beans. This is looking um, towards the west. Now, that's not just chonky camera work. I'm sorry, there's no tripod here. But that fence really is leaning over at about a 30 degree angle. Um, you'll see why in a moment. And they get the full sun right up to midday. And they do very well. And I get huge crops of scarlet runner beans off that for a very long time. Now I'm about to climb on something here so I can get a slightly better angle. There we go. Now as you can see from that house next door, built in the early 1900s, and it's built to the way they normally build them in Perth, West Australia, or in England, double brick, but without a wooden frame. Now it lost the tops of its chimneys in the September quake, but otherwise it was pretty much undamaged. In the February quake it was munted, a good Canterbury word for you there, for widely used in New Zealand, especially Christchurch and Canterbury now. It's lost the entire outer skin of bricks. So it's now only a single brick house, because the double bricks all fell off the outside. And because they fell against the fence, that's what's pushed the fence over. 
that vine over top is the neighbour's vine. There's that plastic reel from work that I use as a stool for standing on to harvest the beans. And cherry tomatoes do good here as well. And similar to West Australia, I've tried the normal tomatoes and they just don't do well. And I really do have to eat the cherry tomatoes though, they're fabulous. Here's a view of the backyard. We're standing at the back door looking out, so we're looking towards the northeast. That washing line was replaced because the old one was munted when the two-storey house next door fell on it. Here we are standing in the northeast corner of my backyard looking back towards the back door. See that um, beaded curtain? Here in New Zealand where there's less flies in Australia but still enough of them in the summertime, various kinds of hanging and beaded curtains work as a reasonably efficient fly screen across doorways in, in summertime. Here's some rhubarb. Could never get the rhubarb to grow very well in West Australia. It was just too hot and too dry. Um, it's from cool parts of Northern Asia and it's a swamp plant so it does go quite well here if you give it a bit of water to get it started. That's uh, Japanese Aurelia. Sorry I temporarily forget the um, the the full Latin name. Here's my um, Fosalis Cape Gooseberry plants, or some of them, I've got lots of them. These were little seedlings sprung up around that uh, cast oil that was in a pot. So that was kept inside for winter and then planted out a couple of months ago. And the little Fosalis seedlings around it have, as you see, they're now more than half a metre high. Cast oil poking out the top with some fresh growth on it. Just about to have some flowers. That's the um, Thorny boysenberry, which is quite nasty to deal with, but does give you nice fruits. Had some good fruits in the past. That rhubarb gets a bit more sun, that one, and it's a bit thirsty today. Needs a bit of a drink. You see the mint by the back door has just gone crazy. Now I harvest a lot of mint from that, and obviously it gets walked over several times a day, and it still goes crazy like that. These are the two locust trees that I had especially bought in. That's where they've lived since I bought them. And in between them in a, in a bucket pot is another cast royal. As you see, that one's gone very tall and skinny and eight or nine feet high there. Obviously, cast royal, uh, Ricinus communis, uh, poisonous if it's eaten by humans, but a very attractive plant with a palm looking foliage. And native to Egypt can take a tiny little hint of frost, but not much more. That's my little um, shelving unit with some baby palms and things on it. That has a like a zip-off plastic bag thing for winter. So it acts like a mini greenhouse. Uh, quite a few of those plants fell off in the earthquake a couple of days ago. They sort of rattled their way off and fell on the ground and got a bit more broken. Um, as you see, some more bucket pots and plastic tubs. These have got uh, Cassiurinas in them that I specially got on one of the rare times they were available. They weren't the exact variety I grew in Western Australia, but they were a related Victorian one. They can take quite a few degrees of frost. And some of the fruit trees I did manage to salvage after the earthquake are the two cherry trees and the quince tree. They grew pretty broken up and lost a lot of side branches, but you see them there in their plastic tubs. Now this here is for the benefit primarily of Carl in Melbourne, who before he left gave me a couple of pots with some acorn seeds in them. And as you can see, the acorns, the little oak trees are doing very well. The weeds in those pots are doing very well. You could quite, cap I would happily let you keep all the weed seeds, but um, and you wouldn't believe how many times I've gone through and weeded them. But but as you see, they are what up to about eight inches or two hundred millimeters high. Some of those seedlings, so they're doing very well, very healthy. Gave them a wee bit of a slow release fertilizer the other day. Don't know what I'll do with them, but thank you, Carl. Every time I look at them, I remember you. Here's, uh, these are some of the cactus that did survive the September earthquake because these cactus and that little yucca there, they were actually up on the roof. Um, I'd put them up there as a way of getting lots of sun. I didn't have to water them. And um, Now here's a little hedge that I've got growing in just about two months. I went out in the country one day with the roof open, stopped uh, along the country road with some pruning loppers and took a bunch of uh, cuttings off of poplar which is a commonly used farm hedge along country areas here. 
I plopped them in. Now since that house has been demolished, that uh, they rebuilt up the ground with just like compacted gravel. So they're planted just into compacted gravel. I had to scratch it out. I was only able to get less than a foot, less than 300 millimetres deep, and then pack the gravel back around them. And um, the vast majority of them have grown. I've planted some runner bean seeds around the base of them, and most of them have grown. So they've got some runner beans snaking up the top of them. Uh, first year you won't get quite such a good crop off the runner beans and as you see this has almost instantly given me a, a like a five foot tall hedge 1.5 or so meter tall hedge for no actual outlay as such looking towards the north from the south looking towards the north uh, some willows there that I got those cutting several years ago now just planted them in bucket pots and there's the Japanese Aurelia that all of mine are seedlings off. This is a neighbour's one, as you see it's hanging over that lattice fence there a bit to my north, so it does shade me a bit that I'd rather not have, but it does. they look very pretty, and it does drop uh, viable seedlings, and every now and then some come up in pots of things or in the ground, I carefully transplant them. New Zealand cabbage tree, Cordyline australis, so it's popularly grown through the wetter parts of Australia, and it can even survive in the drier parts if it's watered. That's an old seed stalk from previous years. Um, again, that has little seedlings popping up in the garden sometimes, and I usually pull them out, but sometimes pop them on and grow them on a wee bit. And nice clean pellets I got from work before stopping there. It's another clear view of those Japanese aradias now. Those ones about uh, half a metre to a metre high, those ones. And just a slightly better view of... Um, this is some of the thornless blackberry. When I gave up my allotment at work, I dug up the thornless blackberry that had uh, quite a few baby ones here. And uh, a view here of, you can see there's some um, broad beans just coming to the end of the season for them, but they're planted in the plastic tubs around the two cherries and the quince. And also in amongst there, and amongst those um, rather pine looking Victorian cassiarinas, is the uh, Flinders Range Wattle, the uh, it, uh, Acacia itiophila, which grew very well for me in Inland WA. It had some flowers on it this year and would have given me some seeds, but it was affected by the snow. It was actually knocked right over to the ground by the two heavy snow, heavy snow incidents we had. Um, the plant survived satisfactorily, but it won't give me seeds this year. And just a close-up on some of my castor oil seedlings. Got a few seedlings up this year from some of the seed I had previously. So I'll grow them on and hopefully they'll be several feet or a metre high by winter time. I'll bring them inside in pots. There's some more of those Japanese Aurelias. They're the small seedlings as I've dug them up out of the garden and potting them on. And here's some Phoenix Palms. Now some of these are the Canary Palm that I dug up in a pot, uh, in a park, sorry, um, from the surrounding garden bed where they're self-seeded. Got them before the mower went over them. And some of them are from dates, as packets of edible dates with the seeds. Now this I'm very pleased with. Of the two locust plants previously depicted, one of them gave me two fruits last year. So I planted the two seeds after eating the fruits, because you can't buy them in the shops here at all. And, um, and yes, one of them grew. And uh, it's, it sprouted a um, one plant. And uh, that's that. Um, these were getting very tall and leggy, these locust plants, so they were almost twice that tall, so I had to head them right back, and in one in case of one of them, that meant really savaging it. So, now there's a close-up on the Rhocinus communis, the castor oil plant. That's, that one's just in a bucket-sized pot. That one actually spent all winter out there, um, and it's just grown some new and bigger leaves just now. It was protected enough by that brick wall to be protected from the frost. So that lives quite happily in between those two locusts, which are just growing a bunch of new foliage now. No fruit this year, the, um, which is the wrong time of, of year. But uh, Some more of those Trachycarpus Chinese windmill palms. They are the ones you can buy here reasonably easily. Um, they still cost a bit. I've grown them on a lot from small seedlings. 
they'll take cold down to negative 18 degrees, so they'll grow pretty much anywhere in New Zealand, and for that matter, England and Scotland as well, if you can be bothered planting them. Just another look there at the uh, from the kitchen door looking towards the northeast, so you can sort of see how that hedge is coming together. So by autumn, those poplars should be well established. Now, of course, it's possible that property will be sold and the house will be built. There could be a, a wall or fence put up there. That's why I didn't want to buy a bunch of plants at, uh, at whatever they wanted to charge me and, you know, start off and have great costs for a bunch of little plants not even a metre high. So by starting off with those cuttings, I instantly had a hedge of over a metre, a metre and a half high for, for no real financial cost. And if it has to get ripped out, if the place next door gets rebuilt, then so be it. It hasn't really cost me anything. So that's all. Here we are, December the 26th, 2011. Bit of a walk around my front and backyard.